introduce Jeff. I didn't know I was going to do this, but this will be fun. <laughs> you have to understand. See, he's going to get to the punchline, right? He's like, okay, Martha. Um, yeah, uh, I had the pleasure of, of hiring Jeff um, as an intern who was uh, driving a rider truck for the Mono Lake Committee bike fundraiser. And we uh, knew that he knew Los Angeles because he'd grown up in Pasadena. But we stuffed him in the truck and said, take it to downtown LA to the DWP headquarters. And he had no clue where he was going. <laughs> he needed to be there at a certain time. And, 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 and he had all the traffic he had to get through. And he did it beautifully. I have to say that in all the, I can't begin to tell you how lucky we are to have Jeff. And I think the highest compliment I can give to him, I've heard from others, that the best thing in the world is to have somebody do your job and do it so much better. Jeff, you're amazing. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> Not true, but very sweet, as I just told her. Martha is a hard act to follow as executive director, and these three are a hard act to follow <laughs> on an afternoon panel. Especially when I'm in the middle, because I know there's good stuff coming, too. But um, let me see if I can talk about Mono Lake and the climate future here a bit and provide some some insight. I get the you know kind of easy question of uh, what does a changing climate future look like uh, here at Mono Lake. Uh, that's um, that's not easy, and I think um, you know Martha was just talking about how in the midst of the Mono Lake struggle, uh, you know what now reads like a novel with an obvious outcome was uh, a lot of unknowns and a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainty about whether. Uh, you know, what, was the, what were the facts that you really had to work off of? You know, what was the science telling you? And I, I would say we're, you know, we're very much in that same uh, place with climate change at Mono Lake, uh, advocates, environmental uh, protection efforts all across you know, California and the world are in the same place because there are so many questions about what the future holds and how will it be different, how will it be the same, uh, that we're really trying to live in this world of multiple scenarios and figure out what's happening. So I, I did a presentation last year. Uh, some of you, I think, were here for that. And um, I'm sort of looking at this as a, a status report. I mean, we're really trying to uh, dig through these issues at the Mono Lake Committee and think through them and go out and find scientists, find information, see what we can to uh, get a better picture of what the future holds for Mono Lake. Um, and uh, it was fun working on this uh, for, for today because we've made actually some progress since uh, last year. But let me walk you through kind of our, you know, this, this is in progress. These things are happening uh, as we try to, try to sort it out. So uh, last year, you know, we started off uh, thinking about the current conditions. And uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, cute kids here and an and a Ewok. So we've got, we've got Lord of the Rings and Star Wars involved in the afternoon. So I think we've, you know, touched all the important bases. Um, and uh, last year we were thinking about uh, this situation, right? In one year, Mono Lake fell that much, and we were, of course, uh, in the drought, and uh, that weighed heavily on our minds. It still does. And now we're thinking about this past winter, which was really quite amazing at 200 plus percent of snowpack. That's from the New York Times. They took these amazing photographs uh, for this article they did out here. Uh, and uh, even right here in Lee Vining, uh, Andrew and Jeff uh, attempting to excavate our offices uh, in the middle of winter in this past year. Uh, you know, just, just fantastic. So we've gone from the drought uh, to this epic winter. Um, it's uh, made a difference. It hasn't changed everything. The land bridge being exposed out to Ninja Island uh, remains. It's going to be substantially covered as the lake rises, but guess what? The lake doesn't rise until July, August right now with the runoff. So some of last year's challenges like uh, the coyotes uh, accessing the nesting grounds of the California Gulls remain, and uh, we've even gone ahead with the, uh, the fence project out there, the electric fence that's protecting that nesting ground for what would now appear to be one year, because by next year the lake uh, will be up substantially. But we have uh, managed to keep this uh, 
local coyote looking for a break in the fence, but not heading out to the nesting ground. So we're very excited to see uh, that it's working. All signs from out there are that, that it is. So we've got, you know, we've got adaptations that happen in the moment, then, then things change. And we kind of get to this question of, you know, where, where is the lake level headed? So just to touch on what the winter did for us this year, uh, you know, we've had a record drought ran for five years, the lake went down almost seven feet, and now we're looking from that low point back in December, you know, now we're looking at a four plus foot rise by next April of 2018. So, uh, remarkable recovery, very welcome, not a full recovery from the drought, the impacts remain, but it will still be lower than the pre-drought pre level. Um, but it gives you a good reminder. What happens with salt lakes and these closed basins where they collect all the water that comes out of the Sierra? They go up and they go down. And, um, you know, that's the natural way of things. One of the questions, though, we really get asked is, what about this balance? You know, what, how is it changing with changing climate? What can we expect? And usually our thoughts, all of us, go right to lake level because that's so important to the health of the ecosystem. And we have uh, from the Mole Lake guidebook from decades ago, the classic graphic, which uh, reminds us of the, the simple situation here. Uh, snow falls on the mountains and it melts and comes into Mono Lake. So we have our inflow. That's the important part of in influencing lake level. That's the input. We've got a little bit coming in from springs and lake bottom springs, groundwater movement, and maybe some precipitation over the lake as well. And then we're losing water to evaporation. And you put all that together and you basically have the formula for Mono Lake's level, but running all the scenarios is a little bit more challenging. So the first thing to do, I think, is to take a look um, to the past and see what we've had. Uh, and this is Mono Lake in our uh, basin, a pre-diversion by the looks of Nesjet Island there. And, uh, you know, there were some wet times in the past. Lake Russell, uh, 120,000 years ago, and then, you know, glacial rise 1520,000 years ago again, um, a much, much bigger lake. We're sitting here on this nice bluff, right, overlooking Mono Lake, which is actually a, a delta deposits into the Ice Age Lake that created the whole plateau that Lee Vining sits on uh, right now. Precipitation much higher at that time. And then we have periods of time like the uh, medieval climate anomaly or the, the Scott Stein droughts, as we sometimes like to call them, maybe 900 years ago. And so this would be a time period when you had uh, about 70, 72 percent of uh, modern precipitation, so dry conditions that persisted for several hundred years, and the lake went down. The thing about these, when you just look back for these reference points, even in this epic drought of uh, 900 years ago, the lake never lost as much volume as it did from this human-caused drought situation. And so it gives us an interesting reference point as we think about the current status, is the lake gonna rise even in the era of changing climate? Uh, Los Angeles, of course, uh, came and took water from the Mono Basin for the city, and Martha's talked about, about that. Uh, if you're doing a science experiment, probably the kind you couldn't get a permit for, but if you're doing one, uh, you might think, well, why don't we run a big pipe up there, we have this nice lake, and why don't we take a whole lot of the water for, you know, 40 years or so, and we're going to see what happens. And that's exactly uh, how you can use this history at Mono Lake to, to think about uh, the impacts of low precipitation or low inflow on the lake. So, of course, the lake uh, went down due to diversions to Los Angeles. You guys are all familiar with this, this story. Here's a graph of those uh, of that fall, and you know there's natural fluctuation, and then the uh, aqueduct goes into operation, and you get this plummet in, in lake level. Um, so that simulated here, you know, a disruption in the inflow. Uh, the mountain still had snow; it was still running off, but the aqueduct was intercepting it. And from Mono Lake's perspective, it was quite a dry period. So, if this is uh, this is a graph of the unimpaired runoff on the four tributary streams that feed Mono Lake that the aqueduct uh, diverts. And uh, if there had been no aqueduct and, and so forth, that's what would have uh, reached the lake in terms of runoff. But you can look at it from the lake perspective, and this is what the lake got during that time. So I, I've been calling it the great aqueduct drought experiment uh, because we really were seeing what happens uh, if you take away uh, a substantial amount of the input. It turns out this is about um, 
the link got about 48% of average annual runoff during this time, so we took away slightly more than half of the runoff that would be feeding the lake, and got to look at it again. And, and as a side note, I have to say, this is the first time I, I put the uh, 2000, this last winter's um, runoff forecast on here just to be up to date, and it literally uh, went off the chart. Uh, <laughs> my chart I ran out, it should go up to about 206% there. <laughs> so that drove the lake to be lower than this 200 year natural climate fluctuation of 900 years ago. So we're kind of looking for some some benchmarks, some bookends. What could happen with, with Mona Lake? Well, if you kept going with the aqueduct experiment, uh, we can run that through the models and we can see the lake would be down around 6350 today as a, uh, as a level, 29 feet lower than it is right now when you're out there visiting, and most importantly, uh, not the lake that you know and love because the salinity would be so high that all of the uh, all of the things Martha and Dave Herbst and Dave Gaines and Sally were forecasting could come to pass, would have come to pass, and we would be in a, you know, a post Mono Lake ecosystem situation. So that's the, the future we've avoided, and uh, a very dire one. So we can say, look, if, if, if the climate future here holds uh, the equivalent of the aqueduct running full tilt for you know, centuries to come, uh, Mono Lake is in trouble. But that was really, you know, Again, we haven't seen a natural level of impact uh, of that scale. Um, what about climate change that's happening, the impacts that are happening right now? Where would we be if the aqueduct had never come to town, but uh, you know, we take the runoff that has happened, the actual precipitation, snowpack and runoff, where would we be? The lake would be up here, according to the models, around 64.16, 64.17. That's essentially the exact same level that it was when uh, the aqueduct started operation. And the interesting thing about this is it turns out, I mean, you sort of, intuition tells you, well, climate change, we know it's already changing. Some excellent scientists have uh, shown us some very clear examples of that uh, today. Uh, but in terms of actual runoff coming out of the Sierra to Mono Lake, the 50-year average has been pretty stable, so far, at least. Uh, and you can, as you can see in the, in the graph here, Okay, so that kind of tells us where we are now, uh, but it often makes us, you know, that just makes us wonder, so um, what, what's going to happen uh, you know, in, in the future? Can we forecast changes? Is precipitation going to remain stable, or is this runoff going to remain stable? Is it going to change? And uh, we get into quite the scenario building situation uh, at that point. Let's see what I've got next here. Oh, good. Okay. So before I talk about those, let's just so just to kind of review here. Uh, so this is looking at the lake by volume. The graph doesn't look all that different than it does by uh, surface area, but it's helpful in comparing these different levels, especially um, in the distant past when the Poa Island didn't exist and things like that. We're really trying to figure out the salinity of the lake and other things. So. Um, you can see the effect of the uh, aqueduct uh, diversions. You can see us bouncing around. You can see this lovely little uptick that's uh, forecast to come uh, from our wet winter. Uh, and again, 40-year aqueduct drought experiment puts us down here, hitting this low point. And uh, if um, all the protections of the lake had been implemented, it would have kept going down to, you know, to this point here. Compare that to the 200-year epic drought uh, 900 or so years ago. Volumes were in that range. And then what we're looking at for protection at the 6392 foot long term average level is up here. Oh, yeah, so um, the, the thing that we found, and that this, uh, the stable kind of runoff you know, gets at this, is uh, maintaining a lake level is a lot easier than bumping up uh, a significant amount. So, uh, you know, we can have an average year. And Mono Lake will stay uh, at the same level, more or less. It might fluctuate a little bit here and there. Uh, but the key to getting up to this management level that we want to achieve uh, is uh, these wet years that really add extra volume to the lake. Uh, and last year uh, we were, whoops, last year we were uh, uh, in this zone, a little bit lower by the end of the year. Uh, and I was saying we had a 25% increase needed to get to the management level. This year, happily, by the time we get to the forecast level, we're, we're down to a 20% increase needed. I mean, we're on a rising trend once again. And so the key here 
Uh, because we do get asked, you know, is Monolake ever going to reach its management level, this great state water board decision, all the things that are connected to that? Uh, and the, the answer seems to be pretty certainly yes. Uh, it's in the time that it takes maybe changing on us, uh, but the key is these, uh, these wet winters that add real volume, bump the lake level up, and then it might sit and be kind of stable for one or two or five years, depending on what nature gives us, and then bump up again. Okay, so no climate discussion is complete without a whole lot of lines on a graph, right? Um, so I had to I had to do these, uh, and uh, um, oh, what, sorry, one more one more thing uh, on the uh, on this guy. So how long to get to sixty three ninety two? Um, so okay, great, take some wet winters to bump it up, but let's put it all together and use um, the model that we have to to do some forecasting. Um, and now, after our wet winter, we've got um, a nine years as a minimum. That would be if we continue to have a, a string of wet winters you know, mixed in here. Uh, or it could be as long as 36 years if you were looking at dry periods uh, you know, interspersed with some, some wet ones. So that's, that's the model outlook um, at this point. Okay, so the question then is, will precipitation change in the future? Is all that you know, great math, but... Uh, is precipitation in decline, and um, happily we're in a state that has uh, a commitment to reducing carbon pollution, to studying climate change, to uh, modeling its effects, and to sharing those tools with all of us. And this uh, this comes from a great state of California uh, resource, a tool which lets you look at um, downscaled climate models and do you know sort of run some of the data yourself. I will not pretend to be a climate modeler, and I'm sure there are uh, ways in which this doesn't exactly fit our situation, but it's going to give you a good sense of what we're looking at in the Mona Basin. Um, and uh, basically what that is, is that th so this is looking at precipitation, and it's running uh, several uh, of the main climate model forecasts going out through 2100. Uh, and there's two scenarios. One is a, kind of a lower emission scenario, the kind that we would all like, I think. Uh, and then there's a second scenario I'll show you with uh, more of a business as usual, uh, high emissions when we can kind of see them here in terms of actual carbon concentrations and emissions. The thing that I don't want to you know, try and explain the whole uh, graph because it's probably more than I even know, but the, the thing to look at here is the precipitation um, is not on a trend, a downward trend. In fact, the numbers come out with it even potentially increasing a little bit, um, which is sort of surprising. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much I buy the, the increase part of it, but in talking to um, some of the climate modelers who really work on the Sierra and have done these downscale things, they, they, they all agree that the outlook for the Sierra is kind of neutral on the precipitation side, maybe a little bit uh, bouncing all over the place in some of the outputs, so uh, a little more worrisome, but there's not a clear trend, even when you look at this uh, 8.5, this uh, more substantial uncontrolled emission scenario. Um, so when we think about Mono Lake level, we aren't really trying to look at, it turns out, uh, a decline in precipitation. Uh, yeah, so it's, so it's not so much a decline in precipitation, it looks like it's our big problem. There are other challenges, but that's the one um, that we kind of start with. And uh, you know, you really want to just be able to then to go and say, well, that's great, that all sounds like some pieces that are helpful, but can we put it in the model? and really see something about the level of Mona Lake in, in these scenarios? And the answer is no, we can't do that, not yet, um, but there's some good progress uh, on that uh, that I'll mention at the end. Uh, but Doug Boyle is a professor up at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, and is a state uh, climatologist, um, has done that kind of work for Walker Lake, and our friends out in Hawthorne. Um, and uh, again, won't attempt to explain all of his work that comes, comes through here, but the, the takeaway is when he ran a, uh, a future scenario that involved climate change for Walker Lake, which is also a terminal lake that's rising and falling, he actually got that the lake level at the, um, uh, at the baseline or the historic uh, conditions was about the same as it would be under this future scenario. So again, reflecting that the precipitation changes weren't really uh, hitting the lake level hard, forcing it down. But, but, of course, there are other things that are changing, and temperature 
uh, is a big one um, in California and in the Sierra and the Eastern Sierra. So uh, these are um, observed changes in the Sierra region. That's kind of a large scale, but you can see um, observed changes going up. Um, some broad scale forecast for Sierra temperatures rising. And uh, these graphs, again, can be done for uh, temperature, in this case, maximum temperatures. And you can see, wow, there's a lot bigger uh, trend line here in terms of what to expect in the future. So uh, these would be uh, annual uh, average sum, uh, uh, temp high temperatures going up. That's the lesser climate scenario uh, or emission scenario. Uh, even more in the higher scenario. And then the, this would be for minimum nighttime temperatures, which have a lot to do with whether it's raining or snowing, what's happening up in the mountains, again, going up and going up. So that brings us to, as we start to feel just a little bit comfortable for a moment about maybe the precipitation outlook, it brings us to the issue of um, snow, rain, and the temperature change. So. Uh, warmer temperatures have a variety of impacts at Mono Lake. Uh, you know, one of the biggest ones um, that we're experiencing in this, you know, throughout throughout this year would be more snow, more rain and less snow during the winter. Even if that is falling, uh, that amount of precipitation is about the same. It's more of it's going to come as rain, less of it as snow. And these are some state forecasting uh, for the future. And you can see the uh, uh, snowpack uh, water content amounts here, and then the decline over time. We're still kind of in a lucky spot um, compared to where it is, but that's a big decline. So that gives you a lot of changing conditions um, for the Mono Basin overall. Uh, Barche and our staff did a little analysis here uh, just in Lee Vining that was interesting. Uh, this past winter even, we saw average temperatures uh, during the winter, uh, warmer than average during uh, four, of the, four of those months. and. 66% of our precipitation right in Levine came as rain. Um, and just a point of comparison, not a full long study, but you look back to 2011, which was a snowy winter, um, only 37% of that was as rain. So you can see a little shift there. Year to year can be different, but we're, you know, we really felt some of these big rainstorms that came through the snow level was right behind town or you know, 500 feet up the hill. Okay, so these changing temperatures, more rain, less snow, what does that give us as we think about Mono Lake? Well, what we really start thinking about is Mono Lake's tributary streams and how it's impacting them. We've got uh, uh, the likelihood of bigger flows in the winter and significant changes in the timing of when the snow melts and when it runs off. And so these, this is a study that was done a few years back uh, for Lee Vining and Rush Creek, the two largest tributary streams. And the point you can see is the black line is historical, and then there's two scenarios, but you can see the peak flows are moving earlier in the year. On a graph, eh, you know, doesn't seem like that big a deal, it's a month, but when you're out in the field and you're thinking about trees dropping seeds, uh, you're thinking about plants leafing out in the springtime, changing the timing of the peak flows is really uh, changing the core of how the whole stream ecosystem works. Okay, so to sort of summarize what we've been where we're at, we've, uh, we've got warmer temperatures uh, in the future here in the Mono Basin, and the concerns that it's uh, raising for us, for Mono Lake, for the tributaries, uh, earlier snow melt, earlier peak stream flows, um, it melts earlier, then there's less in the fall, so we've got reduced fall stream flow, uh, potentially warmer water in the streams, uh, and then it raises some questions about the lake again, increase in lake evaporation, uh, temperature changes in the lake, um, that's a little bit unknown, but certainly something we need to, to be looking into more. That would affect the, the, uh, the water balance in the lake. Uh, and this, uh, more rain, less snow during the winter situation. Uh, stream impacts again, uh, bursty flows in the winter time, you know, flood flows, times when the streams are uh, expecting, if you will, a kind of lower flow. Um, and loss of snow cover, uh, habitat impacts in uh, parts of the basin where you're losing that snow cover. And then last on our list, we got change in Sierra precipitation. Uh, more streams are dry and wet, it's part of the forecast. Uh, and it is the biggest fat, whoops, it is the biggest factor in lake level, um, but based on what we're seeing so far, maybe not uh, an impact directly there. So these are a little bit ranked, and I think a big picture takeaway is what we're seeing is we kind of come into this thinking about lake level, is the lake gonna rise, is it gonna get there? And you start to come out going, 
yeah, it, prob it is, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that's in deep trouble uh, along the way due to the warmer temperatures and these changes in how the water flows in the Mona Basin. And that's where more investigation and more planning is needed. So uh, a quick run through through some of the climate strategies that uh, we've got at the Mona Lake Committee and uh, are working on. And again, this is sort of like Martha said, kind of reaching out to trying to figure out what you can do. Uh, you know, the first, of course, is uh, support the great efforts to reduce carbon pollution that are out there. California doing fantastic uh, things uh, with our state legislation, our state efforts. You can always, uh, you know, start at home, put solar panels on the Mona Lake Committee offices. Um, you know, we have to deal with the problems that we have while we think about the problems that are coming. And Los Angeles, of course, continues to have a need for water, and they've really gone in a progressive uh, direction, thanks to Martha, and there's so much work in the, in the years past, but we want to make sure those go goals are uh, achieved. I mean, the city right now is commendably trying to uh, increase its local water supply to 50% by 2035, and there's even an initiative at UCLA to figure out how to reach 100% local water supply by 2050. I mean, that would be an unprecedented achievement in the city, and it means there would be uh, less demand and pressure for water export from the whole aqueduct system from Mono Lake. Uh, it's trying to deal with climate change impacts. You want to be sure that Los Angeles is taken care of so you're not struggling with a climate change impact and a water demand impact of the aqueduct at the same time. Uh, we work with some uh, coalitions to make sure as California implements its programs that the Sierra, which is often forgotten, uh, gets its fair share of uh, mitigation programs, dollars and in, in investments, things like that that can be helpful. Um, we would really like to have a Mona Lake model that we could plug in and say, okay, great, what if it's, you know, X degrees warmer, or it's Y, you know, Y amount of precipitation less. And uh, Doug Boyle up at the University of Nevada, we know, is uh, in the early phases of this. It's, it's not ready for prime time yet, um, but it's exciting. This is, these are his graphics here. Uh, and we've got Greg and Peter Forster and our hydrology folks working with him to really bring all the intricacies of the Mona Basin into that. And I just talked to him this week, and he's got a potential PhD student who may want to take this on uh, and perfect this model, which would be really exciting, so we could uh, really look at lake level and Mona Lake impacts and stream flow timing uh, in a very specific way here in the Mona Basin. And then there's always things we can do along the way, data gathering improvements, like actually gathering precipitation data out on the East Shore, uh, where there's very little record. Uh, doing good monitoring so we can look into questions like, why is the lake so green in the summertime? And then some good adaptations that are already underway, modifications. Uh, we can use great science like the uh, Airborne Snow Observatory work to uh, come up with very precise information. Uh, this is from just 12 days ago. This is their measurement of how much water uh, remains out in the upper Rush Creek watershed. Uh, thanks to Robbie again for making the graphic. Uh, this kind of information is critical to managing streams, aqueducts, and so forth. And you're trying to figure out how to you know, minimize impacts, maximize benefits. Uh, the fact you could actually measure it and get it back uh, you know, a few days later, amazing. And then lastly, we have some of our institutional things with the Department of Water and Power. And, and these are the new stream flow charts that will be going into effect next year. They're more ecologically sophisticated. It means the way the aqueduct is operating will be a maximizing benefit to the streams. And, you know, again, if we're not getting these kind of dark line peak flows in the first place, then the impacts of climate change are, uh, are a problem, but we still have the main problem that we weren't getting restoration in the first place. Um, that'll be going into effect, but the key thing about them is it allows for science-based adaptive management of those flows so we can actually respond quickly to changing conditions as long as basically uh, Los Angeles gets the water it's entitled to through the aqueduct. Uh, the flow management, the timing of it, the volume, the duration can be adjusted uh, based on the real conditions and science um, at the time. And then lastly, we have our water board decision, which of course we all know and love, and the takeaway point from it to always remember is exports are directly linked to lake level. So if the lake's taking longer to rise, well, it's going to take, LA is going to be the lower export amount allocation during that time. And so the water board decision is very much written in a way that accommodates uh, drought situations, climate change, uh, with the lake being uh, uh, really strongly considered in how uh, the formulas work there. Okay, 
that was my quick run through a whole lot of things, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk to you all about it and to catch up myself on some of the uh, climate science that's affecting the basin, and hopefully next year, come back and we'll have even more, uh, more updates and good news with it.